Having a reliable and streamlined workflow from start to finish is one of the most overlooked tools in photography. It's not just about speed, it's about consistency and peace of mind. A good system not only protects your work, it gives you more time to focus on what matters, creating. So in this video, I'll walk you through my entire process from in-camera setup for shooting, offloading, storage, and some useful tips inside Adobe's Lightroom and Premiere Pro. Plenty of ways to really speed up and improve your workflow. This is the exact system I use to keep things fast, consistent, and stay creatively focused. Straight to the point, real world tips to help you streamline your own process, Let's jump in. Firstly, brushing over my gear and some in-camera settings. I shoot almost entirely on the Canon R5 Mark II for both photo and video. Seriously unbeatable for this kind of hybrid workflow, giving me cinema-like video quality and unmatched photo performance, all in the one body which is exactly why I choose it. It's one camera that does absolutely everything I need. To keep things efficient, I actually shoot in Canon's compressed RAW for all my photos. I've never found any noticeable quality loss compared to the standard RAW, but the file sizes are less than half, which makes a big difference over time, especially for your storage. Shooting in RAW gives you so much more flexibility when editing, but if you're worried about storage, using the compressed RAWs is totally worth considering. For video, I'm always using C-Log2 now, easily one of the best R5 Mark II updates. It offers even more dynamic range and tons of flexibility in post. Definitely my favorite log profile, but prior to this, I was always in C-Log3. If you're new to shooting in log profiles, it's quite different from stills. The exposure meter often just doesn't cut it. I frequently land on about plus one or plus two, but it really depends on the scene. So instead, use the built-in waveforms, another great addition in the R5 Mark II, and far more accurate for exposing log correctly. If your camera doesn't have this, try turning on the histogram as this will still give you more info than the exposure meter. Provided your highlights aren't clipping, you're good to go. Switching between photo and video is also seamless on something like the R5 Mark II, even the R6 Mark II, partly because of the custom video modes you can set up. So I have the custom mode three set to 25 frames per second, C2 to 50 frames per second, and C1 to 100 frames per second, each with their matching 180 degree shutter angle ready to go. If you're unfamiliar with this, it just means that your shutter speed is double your frame rate. So for 25 frames per second, that means shooting at one over 50 shutter speed. This rule allows just for the right amount of motion blur. If you're not using these modes, seriously, it's a game changer. It saves you loads of time, especially for fast pace or run and gun video work, having them already dialed in. You can also customize all your file names. It's super helpful when you're using multiple cameras. At a quick glance when offloading, you can quickly see which camera was used without diving into the metadata. So your camera definitely matters, but far more than specs, it's about finding a setup that suits your workflow and how you like to shoot. And for me, the R5 II just nails it. Next up, offloading and folder organization. So the first thing I do is offload everything to a fast external SSD. That's my working drive that I can literally take anywhere. I name my main project folder by date and a short description. Inside that, I keep things simple, one folder for photos, one for video, or if using multiple cameras, video camera one, video camera two, POV camera, etc., etc. Something simple with a consistent structure is definitely key making searching, sorting, and archiving so much easier. A bonus here, if you are working with numerous hard drives, keeping a spreadsheet of where all your footage is actually located on those hard drives can really come in handy in the long run. Another quick tip for traveling or working on the go is always carrying a fast SSD for working on and a second backup drive for safety. SSDs are great for speed, but if you're trying to save a bit of money, using a regular hard drive as your secondary backup can work too. To add another layer of protection, I actually often keep the original files on my SD card until I get home and make another copy. That might mean carrying an extra card or two, but when you're working professionally, you want to be over prepared with backups. You might not need them until you really do. And when that day comes, you'll be glad that you are covered. Photos, I actually offload all of these inside Lightroom. 
Lightroom Classic, which also reduces a step, meaning they're open in Lightroom, ready to edit once they're offloaded. While for video clips, I just drag these directly into my folders inside Finder or File Explorer. Another small step that saves a surprising amount of time and energy if you're using Lightroom and often rely on presets is that I always apply a base preset automatically during import. To do this, come to the right panel here and under apply during import, you can go ahead and select one of your presets. All the photos you import will then be imported with that base preset applied. This is a pretty rough starting point, but having a look already applied makes the culling and selection process so much easier for me, especially if your shoot has a consistent vibe. All right, now let's dive deeper into some editing in Lightroom Classic for photos and Premiere Pro for video. For photo editing, I stick with Lightroom Classic for the most part, mainly because my catalog is so big, far too big for cloud storage at the moment. That said, for anything I've shot on my phone, I'll still edit in Lightroom Mobile. I've got all my presets synced there, so it's quick and easy, even on the go. I always rely on my custom presets that I've built around my street and travel style. They give me that solid starting point, but I always tweak from there. For me, these aren't a one-click solution. Every photo varies, but when used right, they save a ton of time. If you are making your own, I'd say keep them on the subtle side. It's easier to build on a soft base than dial things back later on. I also have a bunch of save masking presets like this one called Light Behind Subject. It uses Lightroom's AI masking to create radial gradients behind your subject for a gentle pop of light. This helps enhance the light that was already there by slightly increasing the exposure. I usually soften this with some negative clarity and a bit of haze. You can then easily save this as a preset to reuse. Once you click on the preset, simply go to your masking, you'll find it there and you can move it around to the right spot based on where that light is. So little tricks like this are great time savers. If you find yourself using the same adjustments again and again, it's incredibly easy to save your own. When it comes to culling and deciding which photos to edit, I use a pretty simple star rating system. Four stars for anything I definitely want to edit, five once that final edit is done, and two stars for shots that I may edit. You don't have to use these three, but they work for me. But again, find a system that helps you move quickly and stay organized. So another one when I'm working on a smaller group of images like an Instagram carousel, I also use the color labels. For example, I'll tag all the photos I wanna edit in that carousel blue. This shortcut is number nine, so I can then easily filter them together and see how they all work together as a set and come back to it if I need to. You can also make use of collections down the bottom left here, a great way to group a larger collection of images together that you can also easily rearrange the order, which works great for those slightly larger projects. And finally, when I'm editing for longer periods or working from a laptop like this on the go, I always use smart previews to keep things running smoothly. This means you don't need an external hard drive plugged in. To do this, select the photos you want, go to library, previews, then build smart previews. It makes a big difference, especially editing on the go. This means you can edit without your hard drive connected and you only need to plug it in when you're ready to export them. All right, onto video in Premiere Pro. Honestly, my biggest time saver here is having a basic project template set up in Premiere Pro. It includes all my pre-labeled bins, audio footage, music, graphics, and a couple of adjustment layers ready to go. I use this for all my YouTube videos. It has all the things I frequently use in there throughout my videos. So I only need to really import that specific footage related to the video. It's a simple tip and takes a moment to set up, but saves a ton of time and keeps things organized from the beginning. So as soon as I open a new project using this template, I rename it straight away. That way the original template is always preserved for next time I start fresh. I also have all my frequently used sound effects in here preloaded, super handy for my YouTube videos or anything with a consistent structure. This can work really well for things like Instagram Reels too, especially if you're reusing a similar format across multiple edits. Honestly, one of the best things you can do. When it comes to color grading, it depends a bit on the project, but if I'm working with one long clip cut up into tiny little clips, like most of my YouTube content, I'll apply one grade directly to the main video file. 
So under the Lumetri color tab, click across to the main video file before applying any adjustments. That way, no matter how many cuts you make, the color stays consistent across wherever that video file pops up. For projects with multiple clips, I usually use an adjustment layer instead. Add your adjustment layer and place it just above your clips on the timeline. This applies a shared grade across all clips while still allowing me to tweak exposure or tone if needed on each of the individual clips, keeping that cohesive color grade from start to finish. I also use a bunch of AI features in Premiere Pro, which can save a lot of time. I use the auto tone in Lumetri Color to always start my color grade. You'll find it right up the top here and it makes a great first adjustment automatically. And then you can tweak from there. There. For audio, I almost always take advantage of Adobe's built-in tools, especially the auto leveling for dialogue. You'll find this under essential sound. So once your audio type is selected, simply hit auto match, which will automatically level out your audio. This keeps volume consistent across clips and works surprisingly well straight out of the box. When it comes to exporting, I keep things pretty simple. Photos, I have presets all ready to go depending on the usage. As an example for Instagram photos, my preset here has the quality set to 100. The short edge size is set to 2160 pixels and sharpening set to standard for screen. So whenever I'm exporting photos for Instagram, it's there ready to go. And I have this for various types of usages Again, a big time saver. Likewise for video, I've saved a few custom export presets as well. One for YouTube 4K, one for Instagram Reels, so I'm not digging through settings each time. For Reels, I choose the H.264 codec and a 1080 by 1920 pixel resolution to match the sequence with a frame rate of 30 frames per second. I select render at maximum depth and use maximum render quality. I then use VBR 2 pass with a target bit rate of 20 and a maximum bit rate of 24. Note that this is slightly higher than some use, but I find it works really well for me. No unwanted compression while still keeping my videos crispy and at the highest quality. So that's my complete workflow from start to finish. I hope this video was useful. Let me know how your workflow looks or drop a question down below. I'd love to hear your approach. Yours might be totally different, but the real key is find a system that works. The less time you spend organizing and troubleshooting, the more time you've got to actually make great work. All right, thanks so much for watching.